Celebrating four years of talk like you've never heard it before. This is Gap, the Great American Broadcast Network. This is Alex Bennett, and this is The Ramble, and we go until, uh, well, midnight. But uh, for the next 30 minutes, we've got something a little special here, and uh, it is the first of three parts. Uh, a few, about a year ago, eh, <clears throat> less than a year ago, I became friends with a guy named Jack Garfine. And Jack Garfine, let me tell you, uh, was a, a big light in the American theater. Uh, working with the Actors Studio as a director, he uh, gave James Dean his first job, was close confidant of Marilyn Monroe, knew both the Millers, Henry, and... Um, um, <laughs> oh, what's the other Miller? Uh, Henry Miller. Henry Miller? Is it Henry Miller? Tropic of Capricorn. Uh, well, anyway, you know, he just, the guy just had a lot of stories to tell, but the most amazing story he had to tell was how his life started out, as at age 13 he found himself in Auschwitz. And I've wanted to interview Jack. I, I've kind of been reticent to because he's a friend, and, and, and that's hard, and I didn't want to feel that in any way I was exploiting him. But on the other hand, it's a story that needs to be told and a story you need to hear. Um, there are three parts to it. I'm going to run the first part tonight, the next part next week, and then the final part, which is a full 50 minutes uh, about Auschwitz and beyond, um, uh, uh, about uh, the week after that. Um, so tonight we start with a 30-minute segment. It was the first part of the interview. We had to cut it up because Jack is, uh, well, he's old. He's 87 years old. And uh, so it was not easy for him. And you'll see in the interview that emotionally it wasn't easy for him either. But I thank him so much for doing it. And I think that you as an audience, it's not a question of enjoying it, but are going to be fascinated by what you hear, what you see, and what you're going to feel. Ladies and gentlemen, my interview, part one, with Jack Garfine. The man you're looking at is a person I got to know just, what, about, about six months ago, something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe eight months ago. Yeah. It was during the summer. <laughs> yeah. It was during last summer. And... Um, uh, it, uh, he was, you were the greatest thing that's happened in my life recently. Oh, my God. Because uh, you're all kinds of things. You're a teacher. You have history. <laughs> and I want to tell people, the person you're looking at is named Jack Garfine. And Jack has had a rather illustrious career in theater and film. Uh, and, uh, you know, the stories he can tell about that are <laughs> many. But it's like you led two lives if we were to make a movie of your life there would be two sections to it and so i want to get to the first section today okay okay where were you born what where were you born i was born in at the time it was czechoslovakia a city called mukachevo in the carpathian mountains wow <coughs> the carpathian mountains one tends to think of dracula well i think of gogol who said in the mountains there were these monsters that you know when the earth was created they're buried there and not buried they live in the mountains yeah and uh, it's interesting because as a kid i used to be a kind of afraid i didn't know the story i was so afraid of the mountains and when i read gogol i, I understood what yes. was going on yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and your father did what was he? What my he... father was born, well, my mother was born the same. She was born in Austria-Hungary at the time. Yeah. And my father, too, was Austria-Hungary at the time, before Czechoslovakia was formed. Wow. And, uh, and my father was uh, one of the, probably formed a Zionist organization mm -hmm. in Czechoslovakia. He knew as a young man, 
He knew that the only solution for the Jews was to go to Palestine. That was called Palestine right. at the time. And uh, he would go to uh, very poor Jews in the mountains who, you know, had hardly ever seen anybody and outside. And he would tell them that, you know, they knew the story of olden times about Moses and would you like to go back there? And of course they said, yes. They said, well, you have to do certain things to get back there. And he was a young man, he was like 19 or 20. And then he organized the Zionist organization there. And when he got married, the Zionist organization of Czechoslovakia inscribed him in Israel in the Sefer Zahav, in the Golden Book. But, uh, and then his job, his father had a lumber mill. And when his father died, he ran it anyway, but he took it, took over the lumber mill. And, um, and that was his income, but right. ev the most important to him was mm -hmm. that the great sense of humor because he was trying to get us to go to Palestine. <laughs> and my mother, whose family was very wealthy and you know, they had vineyards in Mukachevo, not in, in, in the Carpathian Mountains, not in the, in the Slovak part where, we were, yeah. where my father came from. And, uh, and she didn't want to go because, and he used to make fun. He used to say, well, because your father is putting on a new steel roof over the hotel. And so you, and you're afraid about your inheritance. <laughs> and this is why you didn't want to go. And I remember even as a kid, I used yeah. to hear him make fun of it, you know. Yeah. Did you, uh, did you have brothers and sisters? Yes, I had one sister. One sister. Yeah. Uh, now, it, it, this, is, this is where it all gets kind of interesting. Uh, not that, you're, you know, where you grew up wasn't interesting. But... Uh, you wound up in concentration camps. Yeah. And I, I, can you lead me into how that happened, your remembrance of what was happening at the time that you, that you did this? Well, actually, you know? uh, Alex, this is a, a bad time for me right now. Yeah. Between uh, the first night of Seder. Passover. Passover, yeah, Seder. Until April 23rd. Very, I think part of my physical problem and my health, I think it also has to do with that. It's um, because I was a kid. I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And you know, when a, when a society mistreats a family or, or a people, the kids always think of their parents. They think yeah. their parents are supposed to protect them. They blame their parents. They don't say that, right. but that's who they blame for yeah. be having the problem. And uh, <coughs> and what happened was that um, I sensed already, mm -hmm. what I, in Slovakia, because it started first there. You know, mm -hmm. I think the Slovak Jews were the first one to be deported to Auschwitz. Okay, and uh, we were told at one point that uh, we had to be ready by a certain date. You could take so much sugar, so much clothes with you, and we're going to a labor camp, okay? And well, but wait a minute, let me, let's back up just a little bit. I'm, I, because I was yeah. brought up in Slovakia, this is yeah. my hometown. Yeah. So there, the first Jewish laws came in there. Oh, okay, that's what I was gonna ask. Yeah, yeah, about. and they, so we were supposed to at certain points be outside. Now, the reason I'm here and able to talk to you is because my mother was amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, her family is very wealthy, so they were arranging for, they bribed the entire customs department in Michalovce, the city, mm -hmm. on the border with Hungary. Right. Yeah, it was supposedly, you know what that was, like $10,000. You know what that was during the yeah, war? Yeah, well, that's 
right? And he had a vineyard. He sold the most expensive wines in order to to do that. And the idea was they were going to arrest my mother on the charge of dealing in foreign currency. And they were going to explain to the Slovak fascists that they needed her for the trial. They couldn't deport her. And after the trial, they would release her and they could deport her. And so uh, what happened was I was then 12 years old, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and my father, who was the head of the Jewish community, but, but of, the, of the reformed liberal part, right. So he had a, an idea. What he did was he organized the young people and he was, he was getting the Slovak army. Mm -hmm. They would permit them to get some uh, uh, weapons. And what he was going to do, because they said they're going to labor camp, he wasn't sure. But during the time of preparation, he would find out what was going on, but we were not going to go. He was going to get the young people to fight. Would have been the only city yeah. that would have rebelled against deportation. You know. So, so your father knew what was happening. He knew what labor camps meant. He, he did. He yeah. know that it was uh, that there was going to be an extermination of the Jews, no, or no. they were just trying to separate no, the, the Jews from you know, the rest of the population. I don't think he thought of extermination, but he thought uh, in Poland they they you know, killed Jews, and word came back. For example, the most awful story was, that I remember, is that they uh, lined up the Jews, had them dig their own graves, families, women, men, women, and children, lined them up, mm -hmm. and they ran out of bullets. So they had them wait until the next morning. They had them all stand there, wait until they came back and had the bullets and they could kill them, you know. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that uh, my father had heard the stories, and particularly my mother, because mm -hmm. people didn't believe it. They thought, oh, the Germans, Goethe, you know, Schiller, this is not a country uh, that would do things like that. This is, they thought it was communist propaganda, yeah. you know. And so my mother went and called her, a women's meeting and said to them, now listen here, she said. She told them what was happening in Poland and they they went hysterical. And so the, ortho, the head of the Orthodox community yeah. who was the overhead, he right. was the, the over the important guy, mm -hmm. called my father in and said, what is your woman doing? Getting the women hysterical, making stories about uh, about the Jews being killed like that in Poland and so on. And it, my father said, "Well, uh, my my wife is um, like the heroine in Troy with the Greeks mm -hmm. who predicted yeah. predicted the Trojans. Yeah. That it's not in prayer. I forgot. Can't think of her name now. Huh. And the Orthodox rabbi I never heard of her." He said, who is that? What are you talking about? Well, she told the ancient people, the Trojans, it's not in prayer and you know that. You better do things because you're going to get... My, my wife is like that. She knows. Right. Okay? So uh, what happened was he organized a rebellion during this time. And we were on... And they believed it. So instead of being deported, the whole town was put under, um, you know... Well, you can't go in and out. Right. It was ghettoized. It was uh, under... Yeah, we, yeah. It was locked up. Yeah. And we all had to go get shots. Because what he did was, he got volunteers, young people who volunteered, yeah. to take typhus shots. And they took typhus shots. And then he said, it's a typhus epidemic. You can't take, a, they can't take anybody. Oh, out. okay. And he... Uh, and so they... The, the but how did it come to be? Let's, what? How did it come to be that you were rounded up and sent away to the camps? How did it come to be that you got rounded up and sent away to the camps? Obviously, your mother's family well, money you, didn't. I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. So what happened was, uh, uh, my father. We were on our way to get the shots. 
when a young man who worked for the Jewish organization came running and said they arrested the head of the religious leaders and they're looking for you because somebody told the authorities that this was, this was all set up by you and the yeah. other guy. So we need a leader. So we want you to go to Hungary. And he turned to us and my, mo my mother said, go, 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 you know. And so they, he left and because they thought they didn't believe anything was gonna happen, they thought they were gonna get him back because they needed a leader, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, he, so he went to Hungary and immediately they decided to Slovak fascist the deportations, okay? And the, the priests were the ones in charge of the deportation. Wow. I found a picture, which I'm gonna send to the Pope, of the priest in my local town with a deportation committee, you know, because they took over, the head of the government was a priest yeah. and the entire parliament, and they voted for the expulsion of the Jews, mm -hmm. except for three priests who walked out, who wouldn't agree, you know. Mm -hmm. And the idea was, guess what? They paid the Nazis 500 marks for every man, woman, and child that would be taken out with the idea that they would never come back to take them out, okay? So my grandfather then in Hungary arranged for us to, uh, you know, to the uh, 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 customs guys, that they would pick up my mother and they would put her in jail and they would arrange, my grandfather arranged for a smuggler to get her out of jail and get, take her across to Hungary. Okay? So guess what? Alex? What? They're waiting, they can't come into town. And I, I was 12, but I was very jealous because my mother was very beautiful, you know. At age of 18, they said she was the most beautiful girl in the Carpathian Mountains. And a reporter came from Prague he said, I want to see the most beautiful girl in Prague. And then he wrote in the Prague paper, she's not the most beautiful in the Carpathian Mountains. She's the most beautiful in Czechoslovakia. <laughs> okay. So anyway, what happened was that, that, uh, that we were then in two days, we were, and I was very jealous, you know, I thought because I saw her talking to men and secretly. And then one time we were packing mm -hmm. sugar, but we were, and then and it was like uh, in two days or the next day, we were supposed to be in front of our house and be taken, you know, and go to the labor, go to the train station, right? And be taken to the labor camp. So what do I see? I see my mother talking secretly to a guy in in the entryway of the building. And my sister was, I was uh, 12, she was nine. And I said, oh, you know, mother. She said, don't be stupid. She loves Papa, she, what are you talking about, you know? And I said, oh yeah. Now guess what, then the next thing she tells us, the next day, this is where one day ahead before the deportation. Okay, pack these things, take care of this, and I'll be, I'll be back, you know? So she leaves. I decide to secretly follow her, right? My sister tries to stop me, but I uh, find her. Mm -hmm. So just to show you, life goes on regardless of what happens, you know? Yeah. And so, so I followed, uh, we had a huge garden, and, and I hid behind the, the shed, woodshed. Mm -hmm. And what do I see? A guy in the garden fence suddenly raises his head. He's climbing up. And he notices me. Watching there, he says to my mother, who's that? Something like that. She comes running, she says, oh, you listen to me. I'm gonna break your head, you understand? You get in the kitchen, I don't want you out here at all. Right? So I headed to the kitchen, but I didn't. 
I, ha I hid behind the chicken coop. Yeah, well, what was this meeting she was having? Yeah, I, well, I felt it was a rendezvous. <laughs> this, this is a proof yeah. that she's interested in another man. She was the most beautiful woman in the Carpathian yeah, 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 Mountain, yeah, yeah, after right. all. Also the fact that, you know, yeah. that I was a boy, young kid at that yeah. point, and, you know, and my father wasn't around, and and shows you that, <laughs> aside from all that, the human element of jealousy, all that. Yeah. So, uh, so I, so then I hid, and she noticed me, and she came running up, and I disappeared in the kitchen. Okay. Afterwards, she comes into the kitchen. She says to me, "Now you listen. Now you listen to me. There's a war going on, and if I tell you to do something, you're to do it. And what you did now, you endangered us. Okay." Don't you ever do anything like that. And she said to me, now lock the door. Give me the key. So I locked the door. She says, okay, kid, children. Uh, these people are supposed to, we're supposed to deport her tomorrow to labor camps. I don't believe it. And you know, uh, Madeleine Albright, when I told her the story, mm -hmm. she just thought it was the amazing story she ever heard. Because my sister is nine, I'm 12, right? She turns to me and my sister and says, now, your grandfather, so I met the man, your grandfather arranged in the gypsy camp. The customs guy cannot come into the town. It's all locked up. So we have to walk to the gypsy camp. And there they will be with a car and take us to, 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 uh, the city, Michalovce, where they had their department. And I said, but Mama, they, they said any Jew on the street, if she's seen, would be shot immediately. You know what she said? To a nine-year-old, 12-year-old, that's what Madeleine Albright couldn't get over it. She said, children, I think that death is better than what they're gonna face in the cattle car. And this nobody knew about. So how did it come to pass that you wound up being getting deported, that you wound up in those cattle cars? But, what? That you wound up no, no, going wait. to the camps. So, so we walk, and in the square are the guys with machine guns, and the guy who has the, the candy store, that was a Jewish candy store that he took over, he obviously knew us, sees us, guess what this woman did? Goes up to one of the fascist soldiers with a gun and says, listen, my husband is in a war. Oh, we had to tear off us. We tore off our stars. Mm -hmm. um, in the war, I'm gonna have a party on Sunday. I want you to come to the house and invite the guys. And she takes out a paper to write the address. So the guy thought, well, she must have a paper, something legal because he was about to say, hey, Jews, you know. And so the guy said, I took it, uh, right? We get out of, of the square, and I said, but how come we're lucky, and my friends, all those people, are lucky because your grandfather is rich, has a lot of money, you know? she was always very straight and clean. Now, we get to the car, there are three other Jews that are there. The customs guy. What? Children? We never made that deal. Well, how are we going to, we're going to be stopped to check things? You're going to say they got a deal in currency? You're out of your mind. And the other Jews do said, Mrs. Garfman, please, please, you can't do that. And they said to the, the two customs guys said, uh, you, you, uh, you have to take the children back. We can't do this. We're all in danger if we do that. You know what my mother did? Amazing. Yeah. You want to know about a heroin? She said, look, I told my children what is happening. They're prepared to die. So what I want you to do is if we can't go with you, you have guns. You kill us and I'll write a paper making you totally exempt that I asked for this. You did it purely on my urging. 
and my kids are prepared to take it. Well, I wasn't. I, my thought was, I'm going to run. If they're going to kill me, fine. But I'm not going to stay and wait for them, for them to kill me. So the two guys go off to the side, they talk, and they come up with the idea that we're going to go in a, at that time, the European cars, the back baggage part was not in the back. It was under the back seat, mm -hmm. you know. So they said, okay, we can put the kids in the back seat, two screwdrivers on the edge. There. But the moment we stop for a checkup, you got to take the screwdrivers out and take a risk that they're not going to have any air and then put it back after we move. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother, again, look at this. You know what she did? She had two lemons that she brought. And she said, okay, you hear two lemons. When you're in there and you feel out of breath, or things just squeeze the juice into your mouth, okay? And so, uh, I never told this story, by the way, officially to anybody. And um, so we were put under the seat, and at one point we were stopped. And they put the screwdrivers out, and the guards had a dog. And the dog kept trying to bar, it kept going the back seat there. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the, the, the soldiers with the dogs said, oh, they're after the Jews because they saw my mother and the others sitting there. Yeah. So he said, they're barking because of the Jews, right? Anyway, so we arrive in the prison, okay? The warden comes out, what, kids? Are you out of your mind? What is this? Where do we put them? And then he said, I, uh, and so my mother said, took off a ring that she had, I think it was her engagement ring, gave it to the warden and said, please, let's find a way to do this. Well, I can't, I can't what can I do? Where, one of the, one of the uh, customs guys, said, well, I'll tell you what. My mother always wanted me to have kids. I don't have any. So I'm gonna take the two of them home. I think my mother's gonna be thrilled. So nothing to worry about, okay? And so uh, my mother goes off to jail and uh, he, we get in the car, he, he come to this outside peasant's house and he said, I never forget this. Mama, I have a big surprise for you, You're right? She comes out and she says, children, always want to have kids. Here they are, look at that. And then uh, she understood right away that something was going on. Anyway, so the first thing is she made sure we were washed, we were cleaned, we were, you know, and make, and then showed us the room where we were going to sleep. And there are huge pictures of Jesus, of Mary. Of <laughs> and, I, and my sister said, how can I say prayers in front of this? I said, she told my mother the story. She said, Yankush, that's what they called me. Yeah, yeah. He's very smart. Yeah. Because I said to her, they understood those prayers. They were Jews, so don't worry. <laughs> I said, you can say the prayers, they were both Jews. Right? So for the time, for the time you're, you're kind of safe, would you say? What? Was that, were you safe at that, at that moment? Did you feel that you were kind of safe? Well, I was worried because I wasn't with my mother, but we felt, we felt safe. Yeah. And then, so then the arrangement was made mm -hmm. for us to leave and, you know, smuggle across the border. If we were caught, they would shoot us, you know. So my mother sent word that everything was ready. We would meet in this part of the forest and we go. And uh, uh, the woman, the, the, pe the mother, mm -hmm. she said, well, why doesn't my sister stay? Because I was circumcised, there may be problems. But with her, she could stay as a non-Jewish girl, right? Mm -hmm. And my mother sent word, please stay. Stay with them and don't worry, we'll get you after the war. Do you know what she said? Nine years old. I just, 
As a Jew, I was born. And as a Jew, I will die. This is a nine-year-old kid. <laughs> when we were leaving, the mother went up to my sister and said, you remind me of our saints. You could be like our saint because <laughs> the first day when she made dinner, my sister wouldn't eat. Because who wants to buy? If I had this kosher, and I was kicking her under the table, and saying stop it, you know, and and I was eating, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she said, she so the woman said, they didn't understand, so she said, I can't mix meat with milk, and I can't eat meat that's not kosher, and and she said, well I'll put it separately, you know, the dishes. The next day, the woman went and bought a whole set of dishes for my sister and only served her dairy. Anyway, so then came the night that we were going to the forest and he, the customs guy, drove us to that part of the forest and we saw my mother. My mother took out some money to pay him. He said, no, no, you don't pay me anything wouldn't take anything. You know, it just shows you human beings, right? Exactly why I did a play in Paris a few years ago, the Kafka play, which, because it's called An Address to the Academy. And it's an ape, an ape that became human. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I found an epilogue, which no one knew existed. And in the epilogue, he's in a hotel after he addresses the academy. And a fan walks in. You know, looking at you, I never knew you were ape. You're completely human. And he says, takes him. There's a smell over here. Opens his shirt. The guy says, well, I can't smell anything except humanity. But you, because of your background, you probably have a smell. He says, I hate humanity. Not individual human beings, mm -hmm. but humanity I hate, right? And this is kind of the lesson you learned through this, this whole is, process. I, this is, when I did it, when I read this now in Paris, I said, that's my life, yeah. right? Always said individuals like that peasant woman. And as we go along with the story, we'll see where there are individuals. What? As we go along with the story, we'll see there are individuals yeah, yes, yes, yes. who, who, who uh, were exemplary. Absolutely. And yet, and, and not the people that the, uh, that the audience here is expecting. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Mean, yeah. Not, uh, and, uh, but let, let's, why don't we take a, a, a small break? You what? Know, why don't we just take some time out here for a second, and we'll take a break, and uh, we'll continue this soon. And uh, that's it, folks. I'm, you know, I'm not playing the theme or anything like that because, well, you know, uh, it's uh, it was it's a rough interview. Listen, I want to apologize. I noticed that um, uh, we were getting a large audience on that, and then all of a sudden something went wrong with the YouTube, and it it glitched, and people saw that we went down for a second or so. And then they had to re refresh their um, player in order to watch the rest of it. If you did not watch the rest of it or you missed uh, the story about his uh, sister uh, or any part of it, uh, it will be, you know, can re watch it uh, after the show tonight and all of it will be there because we're recording all of it. We, we don't stop it just because we have a glitch in the video. Um, and then uh, next week, we will continue with the second part of this. And then finally, the third week, we, we get to Auschwitz. We, he, gets to Auschwitz. And we talk about that and what it's like to live in that sort of situation. It, is, it was a very rough interview for me to do. Uh, for several reasons. Number one, Jack is not a young man, and so uh, to keep him on, on target with the discussion, 
uh, uh, took a little bit of work, you know, but we did. And I, I hope you enjoyed what you heard. Uh, I'm hoping that um, uh, you will be here next week, and we'll probably do it again next, uh, next Wednesday for part two. And then part three is longer than either of these two parts. It's 50 minutes, uh, but it takes that much time, and I didn't want to interrupt it. The total interview that we did took over the space of, we took timeouts because, as I say, he's old. In fact, after the second one, we took about a half-hour break, which he went into my living room and sat down, and, you know, he had to, because there's several other places that become very emotional for him. Uh, and uh, then we came back, and I just figured, let it go to the end, okay? And that was 50 minutes. So the total amount of time uh, of these interviews um, is an hour and 50 minutes. And I have edited them into an hour and 50 minute version, which I'm not going to put up yet. After I play the third one, I will put up the whole interview as one complete piece because I would, I, I hope that there'll be people out there who want to show it to their kids and to their families and uh, watch the thing with them because it's a very, very special, special um, interview. And, and, and uh, uh, I, you know, I, I love Jack. Uh, I adore him. And he, also I want to thank his, his lady, Natasha, who uh, is just a wonderful woman. And it's been my blessing to know these two people, that at this point in my life, I'm, I met up with somebody like Jack. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm just amazed that, and, and th this is also, I'm making up, uh, I mentioned this next week, uh, I'm making up for uh, something. The years ago, uh, I got, when I got married to my third wife, um, uh, Susan, um, she w had a family who were what they called Jewish Socialist Bundes, and they were freedom fighters during the war, and they were Jews, and they had the, I'd go to a Passover Seder, and they would tell all these tales and of all the things that they had done during the, uh, during the war. And my wife then said, because I had a video recorder, I had a black and white video recorder she said why don't we interview them why don't you interview them and i never got around to it and now of course they're all gone and dead and i haven't been wasn't able to do that this was my chance to at least somehow memorial uh, memorial uh, forget it. i can't even say words right now memorialize yes that's the word uh memorialize the life of a person who went through this and um He's one of the few last of them. I mean, let's face it, uh, Jack is, went in when he was 13. If he was younger than that, if he even said he was 13, you'll find that out, he would, be, would have been dead. Uh, so anybody um, under the age of, say, 13 uh, who went to the camps all died, okay? Uh, and now that puts the age of people who are alive at about... Uh, his age, and they're di they're dying off slowly but surely. There will be no one I could sit here and interview about this. And I thank him so much for doing it. I know it was it was ter it was terrible for him because it was a terrible time. And you'll find out in the next episode why, because Passover is a very special kind of moment in the history of this man. And, uh, well, you'll hear it next week. Don't miss next week's, okay? And don't miss the big ending to this whole thing about uh, two weeks from now, okay? All right, let me turn on the, uh, the lines have been open. Nobody's called. Eh. You know, that happens. Uh, uh, hard act to follow, huh? You know. Uh, but I, uh, I, I, you know, I'm really glad I got to do this for you, uh, the audience. Not an easy interview to do. Uh, very difficult, as a matter of fact. Not only from the emotional part of it, but that uh, it's, it's a hard interview to do because you don't want to interrupt. Okay? Oh, here comes John Perulis, okay? 
You don't want to interrupt him. On the other hand, uh, you, uh, you, you want to keep him on track. And it, 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 so that, that was the difficult part of it. Here's John Perulis, who likes to live in the dark. <laughs> Alex, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm hearing some kind of weird feedback. No, this is a great show. I, you know, I listened to the whole thing, and it, it was gripping. And uh, I'm so happy you're doing this. Uh, you know, these are the kind of stories we have to start telling, uh, you know, especially uh, for that generation that are dying out. Uh, I have a friend, he's 93 years old. Uh, he was uh, probably one of the last B-17 pilots that are still alive. Yeah. The guy flew 22 combat missions over Nazi Germany in the war. He survived, you know, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got amazing stories to tell. And, uh, you know, just to keep this... Uh, in the public's conscience like you're doing is is a great service to people i man you know this is this is great alex i just can't yeah. compliment you enough on what what you've done here and i i look forward to these no. other two shows don't compliment me compliment uh, jack because jack went through it in this oh, interview yeah. yeah yeah and it was not an easy interview for him to do it was very difficult and i it, there was part of me that felt guilty doing it you know because I didn't want to take advantage of Jack. But Jack, on the other hand, turned out he was... he. Well, yeah, I think if you look at the higher purpose yeah. of, of this interview, then yeah. you, you should feel okay about it. Because yeah. what, what you're doing, this is a real important story that people have to hear. And you're sharing that with a wider audience. Yeah. So uh, I don't think you have to feel any kind, any shred of well, guilt. Well, I wanted, I, wanted to I wanted to document it. And uh, yeah, I yeah. wish, you know, I only wish that I had more time with him. But this was the kind of thing that was um, uh, I couldn't do as a long, for really long form. Because if he were younger, I would have done eight hours with him about this, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he was he's old and he, he was emotionally frayed because uh, I, I don't want to give too much away. But the night they were arrested and taken away mm -hmm. to the camps was during a yeah. Passover Seder. And we just got through with Passover. And every year it, it affects him pretty profoundly. And here I come in the middle yeah. of this to ask him to tell us the story. So, But that, that'll be next week. You, you know, this shit is still going on. Uh, you know, I have friends and relatives in Lithuania and... Uh, one of them is a lawyer who uh, is trying to create an awareness of the uh, in, in the academia in, yeah. in the high schools and the college about the Holocaust in Lithuania's role in it. And the fucking Lithuanians are still denying that uh, you know this is something that should be taught in the high schools and the colleges. And it's outrageous. It's the year is 2018, and they're still teaching uh, Holocaust denial. In, in, in the public schools and universities in Lithuania. You know, Lithuania, uh, Vilnius was known as the uh, Jerusalem of Northern Europe. It had the, yeah. the greatest rabbinical schools, uh, you know, incredible uh, learning. And uh, this was nearly obliterated. Uh, and in fact, I think the, yeah. the Einsatz group and the, the fucking Nazis that did the extermination started in Lithuania. And the Lithuanians know this. They know this. And uh, to to yeah, the step question on is the question is, is how, such a, yeah, such how, a horrible. How long do you do you keep them um, culpable? You know, I mean, uh, at a certain point, you've got to say whole generations have passed now. You know, yeah. and and uh, uh, all we want, all all I find, you know, what I, I found interesting is that. I'm not Jack's age, but I'm about nine years younger. Uh, and I could have very easily, if my father never left Europe, have been in a concentration camp, okay? Uh, only I was living in San Francisco, California, and everything was rosy except when we had to black out the windows when there was an air raid. Uh, but outside of that, you know, uh, I, I, I grew up, in an entirely different kind of atmosphere. To go through that, to me, is, you know, how do you do it? And that's what I wanted to find out, and that's what you're going to find out in the coming weeks. Hello, Phil. Yeah. Hey, 
How you doing? Good, good. And hello. Uh, uh, boy, my mind is Jeff. always up. Jeff. <laughs> it's Jeff. Jeff. It's Jeff. Um, yeah. That's very, it, you know, it's always tough to hear these stories. Um, I probably read at least a dozen books about the Holocaust. And uh, there's no easy ones. No, no. It, it was interesting hearing his, uh, his take as a young boy, seeing his mother, his family, uh, having to deal your microphone's with... a little bit a little over uh, it's kind of over modulating it's not that it's loud here but it's it's distorting so I okay. uh, I'll get back to you and, and hold on a second no, we can wait we have all the time in the world the longer I stall the quicker it is to me going to bed okay <laughs> uh, and, and you know hearing hearing his uh, perspective on his family his sister his mother uh, and, and what they had to do leading up to uh, what we're going to get to hear. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It was a, a good uh, preamble to uh, you know, understand his perspective of what was going on, because you got to remember, I, his perspective is just seen through his eyes. The one thing he said that just, and he broke up crying when he said it, was what his sister had to say. Nine, year, nine years old. A nine-year-old yeah, girl yeah, yeah. Oh, who yeah. said I, uh, her uh, kosher and no 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 but and, and the video might have gone out at that point i don't know okay i don't think so I, well i was listening and the, i, I yeah. had the video going but i was listening and i was editing yeah so. okay yeah. so uh, uh the part where he says that his sister said uh, when they wanted her to do something or whatever to pretend like she wasn't jewish or something she oh, said yeah. Yeah. i was born a jew and i'll die a jew yeah. You know, yeah. This is a it's, nine-year-old uh, kid. Uh, yeah, well, uh, that, I thought you said he was tw she was 12. No, he was 12. She was nine. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Well, you know, so, so people say that history is a living thing, mm -hmm. and I think it really is. That's why it's uh, important to hear these stories, because, uh, you know, I was speaking about Lithuania and the current state of things there. I mean, you still see thug par uh, marches in uh, Ukraine and Lithuania and now in Poland. And if you guys see the red and black flag, it's red on top and a red stripe on top and yeah. a black stripe, that's a fucking Nazi flag. And they know it. Who's this? And, uh, we have it in this country. Yeah, the red and the black flag. Well, not it's the just flag. two colors. Not yeah. the flag, the hate, the uh, bigotry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and right yeah. now in France, uh, people, uh, old people, there was a 90 some odd year old, old uh, camp survivor and as someone that she befriended from the age of seven, uh, stabbed her to death and uh, did it for, uh, you know, so Muslim. Uh, and, you know, here, uh, this hate just goes on for, for no reason whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, it, it's just it to me. It's it's. I always wondered how do you live through something like that, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you'll you'll find out it was very close. He almost didn't make it. You know, I mean, there were several situations in which, you know, he had to work go by his wits to survive. What was the Jewish population of Europe uh, before the war, and then of course six million Jews were killed. So uh, was the population uh, 13 million? And I, I have no idea. For some reason, you're distorting tonight. I don't understand why. Uh, I'll, I'll mess with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, no, I don't know how many there were, and I, I, and I don't know that that's a factor here. I mean, we know that 6 million Jews died. There are people who will deny that 6 million Jews died, but there, 6 million Jews died. Uh, and... Um, it was, um, you know, it was horrible. It was horrible because I just think about I could have, you know, I, you know, it's funny. I, years ago, I and a girlfriend of mine, we were driving through France, and I just said, you know, if we were doing this just, and I named the number of years, something like 30, 40 years ago, we would have been arrested and I would have been killed, you know, and who knows what they would have done to you, you're Greek, uh, you know. That, that that it's amazing how a war disappears, you know. 
And that 20 years after World War II, we weren't even thinking about it anymore. Yeah. You know? Here, here's uh, from the Holocaust Encyclopedia, United States Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum. The Jewish population of Europe in 1933 was 9.5 million. So most of that 6 million, maybe yeah. more, uh, yeah. obliterated. Two-thirds of the population. Yeah. Wiped. yeah. Is it yeah. still distorting? A little bit, but not. Don't worry about it. You know, you can work on it later. Yeah, you know, um, he's going to drive him nuts. I know that. I know him so well. Oh, I'm distorting. I can't distort. It's terrible. It's horrible. Hey, I'm I can't even oh, see you know, Phil new equipment. My screen. What? Uh, all I see is I don't even see Phil. All I see is his lenses. I, I don't know what's wrong with my screen, but. Uh, Oh, you know, I see Jack, I, I, I see Alex, and I see myself, but all I see is Phil's lenses. You know, have you turned into a lens, Phil? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> just collecting these things, and, uh, you know, there's a different lens for a different use. Well, let's get away from the Holocaust, because we'll do, be doing it again next week. So, you know, and then when, once, we, once we do the final episode, I think that's the one that everybody's going to just... Hey, but one just uh, minor uh, Holocaust thing uh, in current times. You know, Paul Ryan is is resigning or being kicked out yeah. as Speaker of the House. I and think. the guy that's replacing him is a fucking neo-Nazi white supremacist bastard. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh, God, yeah, Paul Ryan's gone. But now look at what is replacing him, you know. Right. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Ah. You know, we get what we deserve. Yeah. Well, I don't believe that. The uh, now was it McCarthy from California? Is, is that his name? Uh, that's uh, there's two guys that are slated to possibly replace him. Yeah, uh, one of them was a California guy. Yeah, and well, they better hurry up and replace him because uh, if <laughs> if uh, in November the election goes the way a lot of people think, they may have a Democratic Congress, and then you won't need a Republican Speaker of the House. Well, right? it's. I thought that the people, the Nazi and the other one, were uh, in were the guys that were going to run for his Senate seat in uh, is it is he in Wisconsin? Yeah, uh, yes. I, think, I, I I thought that they didn't have anybody that uh, could run uh, except for this Nazi and a, and, a, and another one. And I was I was thinking you know Patrick Patrick should run for that seat. He's not working, you know. Maybe maybe you can get a you know. Yeah. <laughs> well, you Is know, I, you know, I think that it, 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 it's, a lot of times we see that congressmen and senators do leave their office because they're just tired. You know, I mean, he he said he didn't want to do this in the first place. No, he didn't. And and somehow he was I don't know railroaded into running for it, and then he kept it for twenty years. No, he that was the speakership. Uh, that he was uh, no 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 yeah. he said he never wanted to become a congressman mm. I don't know and, and really? people people convinced him to run that he was hey Obi-Wan Kenobi you're our only hope you know that kind of shit yeah, uh, yeah. I can see he's 48 years old if he leaves the congress right now uh, yes he'll be able to spend some time he has young children but uh, he's a potential uh, presidential candidate and he'll be the right age. He'll be 50 if he runs in 2020. Well, he can spend two years uh, or so, or three years, till his kids grow up, uh, being a stay-at-home dad, and that's great. And then he can run for the Senate, which I'm sure he probably will do. Yeah. Because, you know, he's addicted to politics, so what the hell? Oh, I thought you said he was a dick. No. I uh, Let me tell you a story. i got to tell you a story about today. So, Phil, I bought, I'm buying, I have to still have to pay him for it. Uh, I'm buying a uh, mini Mac from our friend here, Phil. <laughs> and um, it arri was arriving today. Yeah. So, of course, I've got my thing up here with the UPS thing, and I'm refreshing it every now and then to see if it's here yet. And finally, it says delivered. And I open yeah. up the door, and it's not there. Oh, oh shit. And then I go, it says front door. So I figure front door to them is the lobby, in which we have a big sign that says UPS, FedEx, and post office do not leave packages in the lobby. 
And you know yeah. what they do? There are more packages that have been left in the lobby since that sign went up than before. <laughs> okay. So it isn't at the front door. I could look in all the different lobbies to see if there's a package. There's no package. I finally chase out the door and find a UPS truck. And he says, well, I don't deliver there, but let me call the guy. He calls the guy. The guy said, I left it in the lobby. No, I left it in, in the, at their front door. Trump Tower? Yeah, their front door. <laughs> Trump Tower. So I'm going, they didn't leave it at my front door. And, and now I'm talking to the people who, who um, um, uh, you know, um, are uh, at, at, at UPS. And I'm saying, what ha what the hell happened to this? You I know? insured it. It's good. Huh? It's insured. Yeah, well, anyway, it's nowhere to be found. So finally, I, you know, I had called UPS, and they said they would call me in an hour. And the guy calls me up, and he says, well, I'll get a hold of the guy and find out what happened. Blah, 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 blah. And I I go down and to just see maybe, maybe it's somewhere down there or something, or the guy who's coming over. He's supposedly coming over. That's what. The guy delivered it to see if he can find it. I open up the door, opens up, and there's the guy, and he's got the box. He mm. put it, he took it to another building. You know why, Phil? Oh. <laughs> because you said apartment 8L, and we're 8I. Got it. So it, they were, he was really nice. I mean, it was really terrific. I mean, I was ready to yell and scream at UPS, and then I went, oh, it's Phil. Uh, <laughs> the... Uh, you had sent me your address a long time ago, and maybe you didn't use a capital, uh, or, or you didn't. It looked like an well, L. See, that's the problem I always have. So what I usually do is I use a lowercase i, so that there's a dot over it. Yeah, uh, that's what screws up with the... the yes, the because if I do put a i and I make it a capital I, sometimes it's just like a straight line, and it looks like yeah. it could be an L. Like an L. Yeah, so anyway, so I finally get it. So now, uh, I'm, I'm distraught enough as it is, I boot the thing up, and it will not recognize my mouse. You know how when you boot up the first time, it's supposed to recognize your mouse? It doesn't. I yeah. got a whole bunch of other mouses in the house. I tried to make it work with those. Wouldn't recognize them. Finally, I go and I get a mouse I had that's like uh, 10, 15 years old. I think it came, came with my first Mac. Click it on, the thing recognizes that one. Well, it'll probably recognize anything from now on. No, once I got in there, I went and looked Bluetooth, and it said, this, this one is not connected, blah, 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 blah. So I then made it connect to one of my other, my other mouses. So now I finally got that working. So what yeah. else didn't work? Uh, oh, yeah, then it wouldn't, let's see, it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, I had a new hard drive I bought, and I wanted to, erase it because it was a it was made for windows and so i uh, erased it and then it said i can't do that so i had to take it to another machine and do that i finally have gotten the thing up and running so yeah uh so, call me tomorrow and i'll give you the credit card it's no problem did you like the other goodies yes he sent me a book yes. about uh, the about uh, what do you call it uh, big well, box big stores box swindle big box swindle and, and the ear stuff, which I haven't used yet, but I'm getting ready to need it because I'm feeling itchy in yeah. my ears. <laughs> but, yeah, just, but, uh, you know, uh, Q-tip. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very, thank you very much. So I guess, so, uh, you know, but it works beautifully. Otherwise, I mean, I just couldn't get it up and running. It would not wrecking. It's just a keyboard. What did the guy take it out of the box? Oh, yeah, no, yeah. He sent me a keyboard, too. So, you know, <laughs> so I don't need it. I was going to get a new keyboard for that, so. Yeah, that's why I had one. So here. yeah, so I'm I'm fine, you know, and it really looks it works. It seems to work great. And uh, I bought a whole new monitor to run it on, and it, uh, <laughs> it you know, so I can put an HDMI. It has an HDMI input, and you know, it looks it looks terrific, you know. And it, it I'm going to use it as a secondary machine, and once uh, this thing breaks, it could actually replace a Mac Pro, you know. So it's uh, it it has. I, I got it. it. It's got a lot faster. Uh, it's a 3.0. It's a 3.0. Yeah, yeah. Dual core, dual dual core, or, or quad core? I can't dual remember. Core, 16 gig. Uh, and with a fusion uh, drive. Good. It's the i7. The fusion drive, that's which it, it boots yeah. up really fast. Yeah. You know. 
So it, it, it's just great, Phil. Thank you. It was Wonderful. A good huh? It was a good machine. Enjoy. Yeah, it was a good machine, and I think it probably. But I can't figure out why it wouldn't uh, wouldn't take the Bluetooth. But somehow I did a workaround and I got it working. You know. Yeah. You know, sometimes you have to plug it in before uh, you can, you know, and, and get yourself going. Oh, you mean plug in a mouse? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I didn't have a plug-in mouse in the house, huh. but <laughs> but I did have this old this old uh, uh, clunky, you know, clunky one, and it was fine. And now, of course, it always recognizes the Bluetooth when I start it up. So you know, so that was my whole thing. But I was just so panicky about where is the damn thing. And uh, the guy said, oh, I went up and got it. He said, it was still in front of their door. <laughs> he said, 8L. And it probably would have eventually gotten to me because people are very nice around here and would probably come over and drop it in front of our front. But they wouldn't know where to drop it. Well, they could ask who Bennett Schwarzman is somewhere in the building. Not so even though how I addressed it. I don't think I addressed it, Bennett Schwarzman. Well, no, it was Alex Bennett. It was right. sent to. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I got it. I got it. It's it's there, and I love it because it takes up so little space. You know, yeah. all the That's other machines, they towers and they get hot. This thing, I find that my old, my one that I use here is for the server never gets hot. No. During the summer when it's really hot in here, maybe it'll start getting warm. You know, but that's it. No problem. Well, when it starts emitting sparks, yeah. Uh, just turn it off. Well, I'm happy because this is the one that went bad, and they what they fixed it or they replaced it. They, they replaced it. Yeah. They uh, put a new. Uh, well, I I, don't, I think it's the same serial number. I think they put a new motherboard in it. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, in, in which case it'll probably last forever. And it's only because I complained that I was ha uh, that it was cutting out uh, when I was on Skype, and I think that that was probably due to something that I had clicked. And, you know, yeah, yeah, my fault. Yeah. So anyway, that's a, that's the story with me and the uh, and, and the new uh, equipment, and I'm very happy to get it. You know, and thank you so much. And You're uh, the, 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 he he also he he has a you know he's a great guy to do business with if you ever want to do business with him because he has a warranty on it. He said if you don't like it, just send it back. Yeah. You know. Well, what did I tell you? If and you don't pay me it. until you're completely satisfied. So I'll be completely satisfied, say, in two, three years. Two years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the, I don't remember. Whatever the thing is, it, it's it's a nice machine. Enjoy it. The Big Box Swindle, though, is a very interesting book because you were talking about how these Home Depots and things like that yeah. uh, and, uh, uh, and Amazon. Now, this was written a few years earlier. But uh, basically, it's how uh, these big boxes come into play, what they do to the, uh, to the small businesses in the downtown areas, how they'll move their uh, big box to the outskirts of town. And then what happens is every, uh, they build these buildings just to last about 15 years. And what happens is they devastate the downtown uh, all the good paying jobs, guys that had uh, medical and, and benefits, those yeah. guys lost their jobs. They end up going working for the big box in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. And the rest of the stores start moving around the big box. And then the big box moves again. <laughs> you know, well, you know, you know, so I mean, this sounds a little bit, I'll tell you a little bit there years ago. Um, and, and this was a thing that Standard Oil did. And they were they were rat bastards, you know. They they were trying to take over the world. They if somebody had a great gas station, and maybe they were you know some independent brand of gas, and they were doing great business on this corner because they had the right corner and the right neighborhood, and you know, and, and they did just an incredible business. And so what Standard Oil would do was they would start a gas station. On the other corner, and it was oh, called it was. and it was called Yellow Dog Gasoline. They were huh. called Yellow Dog Stations. If you ever hear the term about it's a yellow dog, this is what it means. And what they would do is they would just come in and just give shitload uh, uh, shit low prices for gas. Mm -hmm. I mean, if this guy could only the best he could afford was you know selling gas in those days at nineteen cents a gallon. 
they'd come in and start selling it for three cents a gallon. They didn't care. They were standard oil, and they could afford it, but they weren't called standard oil. They were called yellow dog. And then finally, this other guy would go out of business, and when he folded, they folded the yellow dog and put up a standard. You and, know, and so when you talk about that, it's, it's, it's kind of the yellow dog situation. Standard was owned by John D. Rockefeller. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah, my Probably. dad, my dad had a standard, several standard gas stations. He, he had uh, four of them over his lifetime. Really? Yeah, he, he got screwed by them, too. Basically, he got screwed during the, uh, the years of the, uh, as they came into the self-serve stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. He, he had a service station, you know, the old service stations. And he right. got uh, leased out. You basically. remember that service stations? Oh, yeah. We had we had a, a real service station where we actually we were in San Mateo and we had a, a gas station where we actually had customers. And we had customers up in the Hillsborough, Hillsborough area where we we would uh, um, actually have keys to cars mm -hmm. and we would go up and get cars and service them and bring them back to the customer and they wouldn't even know that we were there right we call them up and say hey we serviced your car uh come pay us when you're ready and, and the, we you know let them know while they're upstairs watching tv we'd get their car and do their stuff she even had customers that you know one one of them ran out of gas up in san francisco and had her car towed from san francisco down to our gas station because she would only have my dad put gas in it wow <laughs> wow yeah. see now today you'd be shot if you did yeah. something like that. Yeah. It was crazy. Well, yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, I, he got priced right out of that gas station. I remember, you know, yes, folks, I'm old, okay? So let me, <laughs> let, me, let me sound like an old fart here for a moment. But I remember when my father would pull into a gas station, three guys coming out. Yeah, and I, was, all, I was one of them. All, all working the car. One yep. would do the windshield, another one would check oil. the oil under the hood, and the other guy was Tires. pumping the gas. Yeah, and they were all kind of dressed in these outfits with, like, I remember they were like rubber or latex bow ties. Remember those? Yep. And a cap. They it to check the oil. The and tie. a cap. And they, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they literally, you would pull in, and it was like an invasion of these people. They checked your tires. Yeah. Uh, I remember I had a buddy in high school who worked on the in the on the Taconic Parkway. They have these gas stations, and they, uh, are you familiar with them? You ever see them on the on the Taconic? Sure, I've uh, seen them. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so there's there's there these little little gas stations, and so we used to hang out there because you know, I was in high school. We had nothing else to do, and he was our friend. So the car would pull in, even though he was the only one getting paid. We were all out there cleaning the windows and, <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and the little old ladies would sit there inside and go like this on the windows yeah wow. it's the spot you miss the spot there's a bug right here yeah here comes uh, here comes uh, rob and, and, alfano ladies and gentlemen hello rob skinny hey, rob how's it going good how you doing good 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 yeah yeah his mic always sounds the best that's his voice well, it, 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 yeah, it's the mic yeah, it's and the mic. <laughs> I sound like this off the mic. Yeah. <laughs> no, he has a great he has a great set of pipes. It's it's a shame that he there's no radio left. Uh, you know, last night we had Albert on. Albert called. I heard. I was listening to it. I I was uh, laying in bed listening, and I was like, oh, I should get up. And I'm like, I'm just so exhausted. <laughs> uh, but I listened. But, uh, 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 you know, uh, he, you know, we waxed about how there is no radio business, you know. Right. And that's a terrible thing because a guy like Rob, you know, a, a voice like that going to waste. Well, it's not going to waste. We have the advantage of using it here. But, I mean, it's a, it's a great set of pipes. I've never, you know, I don't have a voice like that. I've never, well, I've never been a good announcer. Okay. Yes, yeah, Rob. It, it, I, I wouldn't be in the business today if there was a radio, really, I don't think, because it doesn't pay enough. A real, I mean, you got to get lucky. But you remember when radio did pay enough? Oh, that was a long time ago. You know, I mean, hell, I mean, I, you know, I, I, even when I wasn't a big name, I was making a decent wage. 
you know? Yeah, well, you were in San Francisco and New York, and you're going to make a good wage there. Well, I was also in Sacramento, California, and I was also in Modesto, California, and I was in Houston. You're talking the early days. Yeah, I'm talking the early days, but I'm saying yeah. that even that, boy, their video went out again. This is ridiculous. What's the problem? Nothing dropped me? out for me. It's uh, been going. Yeah. On Skype or on, uh, on the website? On, the, uh, on YouTube. No, the it's, the it's only thing oh, yeah, that's dropped out yeah. for me is Phil. All I see is his camera lenses. I don't see any Phil. Well, <laughs> you're, you're, you have a lens and... <laughs> Yeah. It did drop out on YouTube. <laughs> that is. Yeah, it did. It didn't drop out on another machine, though. That's the thing. It didn't. Uh, how many machines did I? Let me see my other machines here. Oh yeah, it did drop out. Yeah, it didn't go out there, and it didn't go out. Did it go out there? No, it didn't go out there either. That's strange. And I went out on. You you were praising YouTube, uh, Alex. Yeah, I mean, I was praising them because in this is the first time this has happened in maybe the two months that we've been using YouTube. You know, hmm. so it must be something, a little something wrong, hinky with their system, which I'll give them that, you know, I'll give them that. But in the middle of the Holocaust story, eh, I, mean, I could kill them for that one. But, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, no, the other machines kept going. So I am I guess I just have to uh, assume that it, it it was a little glitch and some machines couldn't hey, survive what, the glitch. What, what, would any of you guys want to be stuck in an elevator with Mark Zuckerberg? I mean, that guy just creeps me out. I'm sorry. You know? <laughs> he had a decent job. He stood up uh, to the scrutiny. Oh, he, uh, he, if I were him, I would have told him to go fuck themselves. Yeah, he wasn't up against much. It, no, I yeah, mean, to begin, right. with, to begin with, to listen to these, these senators try and act like they know what they're talking about because somebody in their staff wrote them something to read. And, and the then reps when they, weren't much better. Huh? The reps weren't much better uh, either. Uh, the Republicans, were, Democrats were terrible. Republicans were terrible. The senators were terrible. The congressmen were terrible. And, yeah. and then you'd always get the one that would try the political card. Well, are you uh, prejudiced against conservatives and blah, blah, blah? No, they're not. They'll take anybody's fucking money. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> well, I think they were talking about the, the two black women, that diamond and silk. Yeah. Uh, when yeah, they took down. That's two their people. Posts. It's two people. I, and I, and, yeah, and what was it, it, and what was the, and what was the, what was the reason they took them down? They said it was inappropriate and uh, and, and so forth. Now I watched the thing. Uh, you know, there maybe it was slightly um, shitty, but uh, what, what do you mean shitty? I mean I'm I'm I know the two women it, because to begin it, with one of these one of these senators said that these women never get any publicity and the way I know these women exist is I saw them on like Kimmel. Right. You know. Uh, they um it was the way they were tearing into whoever they were tearing into uh that they weren't happy with with them. I, I thought it was kind of negative. And uh, I didn't think it was worthy to be taken down. Was it? Was it bashing? Was it bullying? Was it something that, you know, not not entirely. It just it just wasn't uh, it wasn't upbeat. Yeah, but you wouldn't say that that Facebook took it down because they were conservative because they were Trump. I think that they're, they're for Trump. Yeah, they are. Yeah, uh, but uh, no, you know that's what they're saying. And uh, I guess that they, for months, it started in September 7th of, uh, of last year mm -hmm. that they were dealing with Facebook and trying to get them not to take it down. And uh, no matter what they did, uh, Facebook was determined to take it down. Now, Zuckerberg today said that was a mistake. Uh, you know, so maybe something positive will come of this. Well, the positive was they got all this damn publicity. And they, you know, it's not like Facebook is the only place they can ply their trade. They could go over and do it on YouTube, which they're probably doing right now. Yeah, well, at least YouTube pays. Yeah, but, but I mean, the, the, the idea to think that there's an ideological uh, uh, thing going on at Facebook that makes them take things off, you know, is I think a bit ridiculous uh, because they're, they're a company that's in the business of business, okay? 
and they're not going to take political sides. Do you, do you agree with me on that, uh, Rob? They, they took a, they took a political ad that I try to boost and pay money for, and it was a, a poll from Change.org about a local issue here in Marin, mm -hmm. and uh, it said I violated their terms of uh, uh, you know uh, advertising. And I read that, and I thought, well, you know, I I just had a link. To change.org. Well, one of the reasons yeah. why I'm doing my business with YouTube is I find that they're less draconian that way. They they don't, they're not that shitty about stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but you know, maybe YouTube, you know, it's it's a public company, uh, but um, do do people need to have that kind of access? I thought the whole idea behind it was you see what your friends from high school are eating. And you know what their kids look like, right. and and it's become this visceral kind yeah. of platform where where uh, where people can have road rage, and uh, yeah. you know, uh, I think Rob was smart in getting off of it early. Uh, you know, he just had good timing. Well, yeah. You, why did you get off of it, Rob? I just couldn't take the. I couldn't take fighting with friends and family. I couldn't take keeping my mouth. I tried keeping my mouth shut when I saw stupid stuff posted, when I saw relatives and friends posting fake news, when you just go to Snopes. And, you know, so I started, I started like posting the Snopes links on me. I was like, what am I doing? Why? It's yeah. not going to make a hell of a bit of difference right. to anybody. But just I just use it to publicize the show. That's the only reason I do it. At this point, by the way, turn your mic down a little bit. You've got the same problem that uh, um, Phil has, where there seems to be a little over modulating. It's not that you're loud, but that you're distorting. Did uh, did what I changed to fix it? Yeah, you could take it down some more, actually. Really? Yeah. You could always try whispering, Phil. No, yeah. I'll use that mute button. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I. Uh, uh, I was fed up with Facebook a, quite a while back, but the only reason I do it is to just let people know, hey, the show's on, listen to the show, here's who's on tonight. Uh, I try to not interact with it too much because I just find, as you did, that it just gets fucking annoying. If I said something where I, I just believed something, all of a sudden somebody would go after me for it. You know, there were all these people laying in wait to be the naysayers, you know? And fuck you, I don't need that. It, it's my Facebook page. Yeah. Goodbye, you're no longer my friend. Blow me, you know? But I, you know, people say, well, you can, you know, it, Zuckerberg was saying, well, you know, you can decide who's who are your friends and who aren't. You can decide what information you want to give and don't give. But the fact is that uh, y you have that ability, but it, it, it you don't have to have a person be a friend to post something on your page. You you can uh, nobody can post anything on my page. Uh, you know, Dan used to post all of this stuff about pot and, and so forth. And my mother calls me and says, who's this Dan? You know, and I said, okay. Yeah. But finally I had to ban my mother because she commented. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't matter. <laughs> so she got banned. And she's 90. <laughs> you are a motherfucker. No, you're not, obviously. She, she's banned. But <laughs> she probably just figures, oh, I don't know why it doesn't work. I unfollowed, or not unfollowed, what's the word for it when you don't friend. look? No, uh -huh. I didn't unfriend. I, I did it so I had so many family members who right. I just stopped seeing. I, I turned I off their... See, yeah, you can, yeah, unfollow. I didn't unfollow. I, yeah. I had so many friends that I unfollowed. It was the first... <laughs> And then I, I realized, I said, what the fuck am I doing? See, but I, I don't know about you, but I, I feel sorry for Zuckerberg in this respect. That, uh, you know, he's not the only game out there. And he's the one that the, the, uh, the Cambridge Analytica used for their um, uh, devious you know, ways, they, okay? Huh? They might have used some, some of the other ones and they just didn't get caught yet. Well, I don't feel sorry for him at all. This yeah, is, I agree, man. I agree with you, Rob. To be on top of this shit. And what is this? Uh, I'm, now, I, I, I will tell you, I've burned out. 
I have been a CNN junkie now since the election. I finally burned out. I ha- I didn't know anything about the Zuckerberg thing. I just, for the first time, launched CNN.com, and I see Zuckerberg admits Facebook collects data from people who haven't even signed up. What the fuck? What the fuck? How do they do it? Hey, check out Matt Taibbi on Rolling Stone. He's got the most intelligent analysis of what's wrong with uh, Facebook that I've read anywhere. Well, and he, Matt but, but here's the thing. Here, here, here's the thing, okay? To begin with, um, uh, 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 Facebook was created in a dorm room at Harvard by a bunch of people smoking pot, Okay. And it goes from that to being a major multi-billion dollar organization. And yeah. all of that within a very short amount of time, almost not enough time for them to stop smoking the pot, okay, if they have it all. And so as all these things are happening, they don't see any responsibility to what they're doing. You know, they don't see a responsibility to their mission. They just see that they did something they did for fun. People were having fun with it. They added more fun to it. Oh, hey, look, I'm a billionaire now because I was just having fun. And and so, I mean, it's, it's not like they sat there and said, what is our responsibility to America? Because to begin with, they probably never thought that their platform would be used to rig a campaign. Right. You know, that was probably the last thought they ever had. They thought, hey, everybody will just be talking to everybody else and be a way to have communication with other people and so on. In 2011, I listened to a, um, a speech by this guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, and he was talking about the, I think it's called Newfield chip, where uh, they, it's in your phone and they know where you are. And let's say you're in Walgreens and you're looking at potato chips, it sends you a, uh, a coupon, 50 cents off wise potato chips or something. Uh, and, and so this technology, we knew, we knew it was coming, and, uh, you know, and they thought they were going well, to wait, 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 wait a minute, Phil. Of course people are going to know when you use your phone where you are because you're using a cell phone. You're not using a wired phone. Yeah. And they always knew where you were with the wired phone because they knew where you were calling from. Okay, right. but now they know they can hone in on where you are and where you're traveling because you use that phone. It goes to cells. It bounces from one cell to another. And that that's a way of finding these things out. Anybody who thinks that their privacy is sacrosanct in this age of these kind of electronics and yet they want these electronics better go fuck themselves because I've got news for them. They know where you are. So on Facebook. I put out, I got my phone number there, my address, the whole thing. It, it, it's, it, I figure it's a way to find me. And I knew that uh, I was putting that information out there and it was going to be accessible. I'm, I can find my wife anytime I want to. I f- go to find my friend on the iPhone and I can find out, oh, hey, she's taking the bus right now. She's coming home, you know. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. I better make it's, the bed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, if you're not using your phone, you have a, you have a, a, a an easy pass in your car, right? It knows where you're going. Yeah, it's exactly. GPS every which way. We have no privacy. But there are companies who can take this data and just it's double edged, right? This technology is a double edged sword because as good as it can be and as convenient as it can be is how bad it can be and how it can be used against this country. And that's what happened to us. Early on in around 2000, I did a carpet job I mentioned for a company called DoubleClick. Mm-hmm. And DoubleClick is now owned by Google. But what their deal was is they, they kept track of the sites that you would visit. So they'd see what you were interested in, and therefore they could direct ads uh, to you to, uh, you know, entice you. Minority them. Report. Well, that no, the Double, really double Click account. was the original yeah. company, I think, yeah. that, that followed people's patterns. Right. Um, uh, and, yeah. but, but, but they were also good for something, too. I can't remember what, but you always had the ability to uh, go on into your browser and say, Double click, you can't you can't come in here. You, double click, 
was used a lot for uh, cookies and yeah. for being able to bring up things on your screen selling you advertising. They were good for $25,000 worth of carpet. <laughs> But they do it everywhere. I mean, when you go to the grocery store, what do you get? Coupons after you've bought everything. You get coupons for everything you related to that you bought the last time yeah. you were there. But anybody who thinks, you know, that, that, they, that you're going to be on Facebook and then Facebook is free and that somehow there isn't a price to pay here and that price is a certain amount of privacy right. is nuts. You know, and nobody, and, nobody, and nobody told you you can, you know, you can just opt out of Facebook yeah. Except for the fake news, what's so bad about them uh, marketing and, and getting your information and, and selling it to, to, to other people? But you signed up. Uh, there was a, an agreement. You, when you clicked on it, it says, I agree. And uh, that allowed them to yeah. use information. But yeah, yeah, but there's a truth in advertising problem there. They're not really telling you the scope of what they're doing with their information. But you got to know and that they are. Well, you got, you, uh, how stupid are you to think that nothing's being done with your information when a while back you looked up uh, uh, um, Nestle cookies and then all of a sudden there are a bunch of cookie ads? Oh, you know, the agreement is this cancer thick. or diabetes. Yeah. Is that the agreement? What's that agreement? It's this thick. Yeah. <laughs> you read the agreement. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, I, I would look at something like, uh, you know, prostate cancer or diabetes or, uh, you know, something like that. And then all of a sudden I get barraged with articles and, and offers and, and so forth. I, I was looking for a bed. You know, but I, what I, it is I, is you went to you went to a you went to a site. You know, a lot of times you'll blame this on Facebook, and you can't blame it on yes. Facebook. You go to a site for cancer or something, and it drops a cookie on your on your computer yeah. when you accept to do something there. Okay, hey, you know the one and then it will show up. It will show up on Facebook as an ad because that cookie is lingering in the background, and you, then you turn around and you blame blame Facebook. All Facebook really is doing is it is okay. it is they have advertisers, and they're simply targeting the advertising of their advertisers to people they think would be receptive to the advertising. Mm -hmm. That's the same as a sponsor going to a network and saying, I want to buy this show because you've got these kind of people watching. Why do you? Why on the 6.30 news every night are no, nothing but medicines being advertised? <laughs> because they know old people are there. It's and not, one of the senators... Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Rob's trying to say something. Yeah, it's not the same. It's, you don't it's, think it's the same? It's, no, it's a fraction of it because it's 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 the big, it's the tip of the iceberg is the same. The rest of it is a lot of underhanded crap. They're they're stealing data from you. You, it's not clear when you when you go on Facebook mm -hmm. and you go to the settings. It should be crystal clear what you're giving away, and it's not. You have to. You got to be a, a lawyer to figure well, out. It sounds like they will now. I, I know that John was trying to say something too. Uh, uh, you, you know where this doesn't work? Guns. Uh, you know, I've Googled different types of guns. You know, with assault rifles, I wanted to see what kind of models and stuff are out there. I never ever get a gun ad. Never. It never shows up. So I think uh, there is some kind of blocking software. Yeah, I don't think they put those kinds of ads on Facebook, because uh, I don't right. have a gun either. Uh, I, I do, I think it's in the mail. I, you know, I joined the NRA, so I'll tell you, I, I, I Yeah, if I go to, uh, let's say, okay, here's a good example. Uh, when I used to have it on my browser, like Drudge, okay? And let's say I was some on other, some other site looking at, I was at, uh, I was at Amazon looking at TV sets. And now and I go to the, the to the Drudge, and what am, I, what am I getting? I'm getting yeah. ads for Amazon's TV sets. Right. Okay. So Amazon yeah. is dropping those little turds in my browser, you know, right. and I much more so than Facebook ever did. Now, mind you, I have no great love for Facebook because I, I think they're a little too snotty with the way they run their video thing, and it's not very good. This Tonight is the first night that we've had any problem at all with face with YouTube and it recovered itself. I didn't have to sit there and reboot here and do all of that. It just recovered itself. But every time with Facebook, I 
I had nothing but troubles, and I had troubles also with if I would play something and they got snippy and thought it was in copyright and it wasn't. All of a sudden, there's no picture there anymore. It's blanked me out. Well, fuck you, Mark Zuckerberg. You know, I got better things to do with my life. So I, that's why I went to YouTube. No, I don't have the same audience size watching my videos as watched me over on Facebook. But so fucking what? You know, you know what's going to come out of this that I think is going to be good? It's called opt-in. Now, uh, I think that what's going to happen is, is they're going to set a precedent that you have to opt in if you want things. And thank God, I, I don't, I don't think that I don't think that's going to happen. What I well, that's what they said. What do you uh, think, Rob? Do you think that's going to happen? We said that they can help it because who would opt in? No one. You're going unless just it, make the stuff you want. Unless they're going to tell you it's a dollar ninety nine a month for Facebook, unless you opt in. <laughs> Good so point. That well, that that so that, that is not funny. a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. Or better off, better uh, uh, else, for a dollar ninety nine a month, you can opt out of yeah. anything. Uh, you know, That's their do it that there might way. be a business solution. That's their saying. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Jeff. <clears throat> Well, by I the way, by the, the way, Jeff, your picture isn't wide tonight, and I have no idea why. I, yeah, same wide. with Phil. No, yeah. no, Phil is. Phil's wide. No, mm -hmm. not for me. He's just a bunch of lenses. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what your I problem is. Anyway, but don't worry about it, Jeff. You look fine. Right. Hey, let me talk now, and then I'll, I'll reload it. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I work with a, a small company it's a, it's a one guy company and, and he develops software and things like that and he has a, he has a, a program it's called you are here and and what he does is is while there's a restaurant that that uh, that he's working with and on their restaurant they put little beacons close to the restaurant and so if you're working down this mall Mm -hmm. and you get close to that restaurant, it'll pick up on your cell phone from this beacon, and it'll say, hey, for lunch today, we give you 20% off of whatever, because the burgers are great today. So do you think that's wrong or good no. or bad? No, I think it's good. I think activists should use that kind of stuff to put out political messages on the street. Yeah. Well, actually, he did. he's he's done that. Yeah, too. Rob, that's, like, like, my that's like broadcast advertising to me. That's not the same as Facebook because this is just we're sending you a message. We're not yeah. spying yeah. on you to see what you're interested in. But so but but I didn't turn the radio on to get the message. In other no, words, I didn't you, make myself available to that message. The fact is, it hit my phone as a message, and that's. And but you know, you know what this reminds me of. Technically, he gets message that he's not even looking for. Mary, men, remember the uh, Sci-Fi Picture Minority Report? Yeah. And when a guy would walk down the street, it would say, "Hey, Bob, would you like a good hamburger?" Because it recognized that you were Bob. Now, what that's what we've beacons, come to. That's really what we've come to. What you got to do is put these beacons in other people's stores so that when somebody walks into Joe's carpet, uh, they say, oh, well, come on over. We're having a sale <laughs> at, uh, at my carpet. Hey, <laughs> hey, they're going to start implanting nano chips. You don't even know you got one because they'll put it in food. You eat something and it's going to stay with you. It's going to go through your digestive tract and, exactly. you know. Yeah, I'll be in your car. I figured it out. <laughs> uh, reason you're probably seeing only part of my picture is yeah. that uh, um, it, it's cut off on your screen. And yeah. if you click so. on my picture, uh, it'll probably go full. Did you do it? Yeah. Nope. Nope. No? It's not working. Nope. It, it clicks to a little bit bigger, so I see a corner of your head. Huh. No. Nope. Huh? No. Yeah. I don't know. What, what kind of machine do you have? Uh, it is a new computer. It's an Acer uh, 1080. So it's a PC. Screen. It's a PC. It's got an Intel one. Now, oh, I don't know uh, why I'm using a PC I5. here. And what, what and what kind of browser are you using? Uh, Slimjet. What? Yeah, I use Slimjet. 
S L I M J E T. Because yeah, all the other browsers uh, are too invasive. I don't like any of them. E- even uh, uh, what's uh, uh, oh shit, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Chrome. Uh, uh, no, I was thinking of Net Objects. Uh, what is that? Uh, Never heard of. It. No. Well, anyway, um, uh, hello to Tim, by the way. Tim, did you have something you wanted to say here? Well, actually, you said exactly what I was thinking. Bef- I was thinking right before you mentioned uh, Minority Report that someday soon you'll be walking down Times Square mm-hmm. and all the huge screens, everybody will see a different message <laughs> based on who they are, yeah. almost like wearing Google glasses. Right, right. Yeah. It'll be virtual reality. Actually, the, the Olympics had some some uh, augmented reality. Did, did anybody catch that? No. In North in South Korea. No. Some of the, some of the, the opening and closing ceremonies. Some of the some of the uh, op, some of the uh, pageantry was you had to look through your your phone like uh, you would with Pokemon Go. Oh, yeah. Well, here, 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 here. here, here. Some of the co- lights and colors to it. Here is something that's kind of interesting, though, is that, um, and they they don't seem to have. What happened to Jim? We just lost Jeff. Oh, oh um, you know, he said he was going to fix something. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway. So. Anyway, uh, where was I? Um, so I wanted to uh, I wanted to continue with that uh, talking about the. Oh, uh, the, oh yeah. Yeah. Um, there was a thing that they were talking about, and I didn't see, it's never come to be, so I, I don't know what the story is with it, but it, it, we never seem to have had a, a, a resolution to it. But there was a story a while back that the networks were thinking of doing targeted advertising. They felt that much like uh, the internet can target you by putting an ad on a page because of who you are and because you looked at something and you were interested in that, they could do the same thing with television and that everybody sat at home and got commercials coming during the breaks on those TV shows would get different commercials. Like if I want, that's like a max headroom. Remember that that was a brilliant show. In other words, uh, it would all be, it it would be automatic targeted advertising. Yeah. And they felt that if you could do what, how would they get the feedback on you to know, what it is that would they would target to you through Facebook? Uh, the, uh, that I don't <laughs> know, but TV they but they felt that if you could do it, if you, they felt if you could do it with computers, with with it, the internet, you could do it with TV. We, uh, uh, Alex, they have that on the next headroom. No, they do have it. I'll tell you where they have it. Do you ever watch shows online? Yes. Yeah. Have sure. you ever watched a show in one town and then the next week you watched it in another town and it was a different set of commercials and they were local right. advertisers? That's right. Yes. So well, isn't that a cable now. thing? Yeah. Yeah, but that's not going to get it down to the person. That'll get it down to a region. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't. See, the only way I. But, but see what that- I'm saying is that's an example of the fact that if I'm in New York and they sense that I'm picking up the show, watching it in New York. Yeah, they have they, a certain set they, of commercials, and then I was up in Vermont, and I was up there, and I went, gee, all these commercials that I'm getting off of ABC are for, like, Mark's Cider Shop, you know? Right. Uh, if if you watch your TV through streaming, it's already being done, I believe, right? That's what that's I said. Yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. 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 And then pretty soon, the only way to get TV, probably 10 years from now or even sooner... You, streaming will be the only way to get your TV soon. Oh, by the way, Jeff is now wide. Yeah. Hey, I just wide res- also wi- also I wide. reset also the wide. whole thing. So yeah. I don't know what was wrong. Now, now I see Phil wide. I see your whole thing in that ca- little can of lube in the uh, t- on your shelf way in the back there. Yeah. <laughs> right there. You mean, the, uh, you mean the can of lube he doesn't need anymore? Yeah, you put that in the cigar. <laughs> Uh, it, it's uh, it's something you put in a uh, humidifier for uh, cigars. Uh, uh, cigar juice. Yeah, yeah. What's it called? Did you hear that Zucker, Zuckerberg canceled all of his future testimony? All of his future it's, testimony? Well, he came down with a bad code. Uh, uh, I, yeah. Icar. Zycar. Yeah. Oh, Zycar. Zycar. What is that? Uh, it's a 
What, what is it? It's, uh, it's some so, sort of liquid it's that they call. Wait a minute, you have a bottle of something and you don't know what it's for? Yeah, sure it tastes good. It's for my tomorrow. <laughs> Zuckerberg's avatar will visit Congress. Yeah. I <laughs> think that's what this? we've been seeing, man. <laughs> he's not uh, a, um, a humidor. All I know is he's probably uh -huh. going back. He's probably going back to the California and just saying, I can hardly wait to rip this fucking suit off of me. You know. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, he, he was so respectful. Congressman, congresswoman. He, you know, he, he prefaced every answer with uh, their rank. Yeah. Well, he doesn't want to be regulated, Phil. Yeah. He Stop. wants to decide what kind of regulation he's going to be subject actually, to. That's why he was nice. Actually, his his first TV interview that he did with that woman, he, she asked him about that, and he said, maybe Facebook does need to be regulated. I don't want to do the regulation, but maybe Facebook needs to be regulated. He did say yeah. that. Yeah, well, here, here's the thing, though. Here's the thing, though. Uh, it, it, regulated by who? These morons who don't even know technology? Come on. Do you really yeah, want... Sure. Do you uh, want some of those know, idiots who are asking like, him questions like to... Like David Hogg. Yeah, the new generation, the millennials. Yeah, they're chomping at the bit to come up with some more regulations. They, you know, they can't... They don't feel like they're doing their job unless they regulate you. That's why Trump is out there just knocking them off uh, left and right. Because, hey, yeah. hey, Rob, did you see where Sandberg canceled her interview? With Was it ABC? Because Martha Raddatz was going to interview her at the last minute. Who's that? She, who, who is that? Uh, the second in command of Facebook canceled an interview on ABC because it wasn't going to be Stephanopoulos. It was going to be Martha Raddatz, who she knew would grill her like she should be grilled, and she canceled the last minute. Uh, I, I've seen that woman uh, from, from Facebook, and she's a pretty sharp cookie. I think she can take the grilling. I think, I think, I think legal told her not to. Because she knows that she gets softball from, from Stephanopoulos. No, but, hey, sir, but I, sir, I, don't think, I don't think she's afraid of anybody. I've seen her interviewed, and she's a pretty tough cookie. Sarah yeah, Palin but I, I think Martha Raddatz is, is, is even tougher than she is. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, like WWE. Is that a, is is this come under a, a conspiracy theory? What he's saying? I think I I can't speak. No, no, I, no. It's a true story, but I think well, it's a true story. I, but it's really a conspiracy. Wait, is it really a true story, or where did you read it as a true story? <laughs> J, uh, Tim. Tim. Uh, uh oh, he's uh, he's mad. He's been censored. Tim, I, I got another call. I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> well, that's what she should do with Martha Radnitz. You know, I've got another call. I'll talk. I'll finish this interview in a couple of minutes. Hey, they call a show and then they put you on hold. I'll tell you a great story. I'm going to tell you a great story about an interview. A friend of mine named Earl Dowd uh, did a film, a book, a movie, a movie, a record years ago called The First Family, which still is maybe the biggest selling comedy album of all time. Um, was interviewing. It got in, landed an interview with Salvador Dali. Now, I don't know if a lot of people out there remember who Salvador Dali is, but he was an artist. Yeah. He was a, a wacko yes. artist with a big mustache and you know, you know, really weird. And uh, before the interview, he had heard a story that, uh, uh, this was at the St. Regis Hotel, that when um, um, Dali would book in to the hotel in New York City, he would get these little, like, peanut butter cups, you know, these little cups filled with peanut butter and chocolate, right? And he would buy, like, enough of them for the days that he was going to be there or wanted to be there. And then he would put them on uh, someplace like, uh, like a, a, you know, a mantle or something like that, and then he would eat one a day, and when the last one was gone, he would leave, Okay, so my friend goes to interview him, and he starts interviewing him. And about five minutes into the interview, Dolly says, "Wait a minute, I have to go do something. I'll be right back." And he leaves, and about a half hour later, he comes back. So um, uh, 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 Earl starts to interview him again, and about three or four minutes later, he says, "Wait a minute, I got to do something, and I'll be back in just a moment." And he leaves and comes back about twenty minutes later. 
This goes on about three times, four times. Earl is getting pissed because it's very hard to do an interview where you, somebody starts it and then he stops it after five minutes and then starts it again, right? So finally, after about the fifth time this happened, Dolly leaves the room and he looks around the room and there's a, a, a fireplace and there's a mantle on the fireplace. And sure enough, there are some of these chocolates, these little peanut butter cups on the mantle. I eat them. So, so he remembered the story that he'd been told. So he went over to the mantle and ate all the peanut butter cups. He checked the next day. Dolly left town that day. <laughs> hey, uh, now, your friend uh, uh, McCann. Uh, Chuck McCann. Away. Yeah, I, mentioned, okay. I forgot to mention that, actually. Was he Officer Joe Bolton? No. Chuck McCann passed away? Yeah, Chuck McCann passed away. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay shows that Chuck McCann have when I was a kid. He used to show it, it, on Sunday morning on Channel 11 with Laurel and Hardy. It was a show called Let's Have Fun. Let's Have Fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, you know, it, it was, he used to do Saturday cartoons. and he, Not cartoons. He would show Laurel and Hardy shorts. And he always had the two puppets of Laurel and Hardy. And he did the uh, he did both voices. Well, who was Officer Joe Bolton? That was the Three Stooges. Oh, but who was the guy that Announced Dr. J uh, that's Joe Bolton. Yeah, Joe Bolton. Oh, is that really his name? I thought it yes. was Chuck. No, no. It wasn't an, he wasn't a policeman, but he was Joe Bolton. Yeah. See, uh, I always watch the cop shows. <laughs> uh, I, I, sometime I should, I, I've told the story before, and I, it's too long to tell now, but uh, Chuck McCann told me a story once about um, um, the. Um, uh, he was working at, I'll tell you the story. He was working at WPIX, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they had this uh, Saturday night show. And it was this guy, it was, I don't know, something like the rotisserie movie or something. He had this rotisserie. And he would bring it out and he'd slab some, put some meat on there. And as the movie was going on, they'd go back to the meat and see how it was doing. And by the end of the movie, you had yourself a lovely roast beef, Right. So he, he, uh, uh, he, the guy starts his show, and he's going to have a lovely roast beef here, and he puts it in the uh, rotisserie, and it spins around, and he come back, and it's getting better and juicier, and finally by the end of the, just before, he, just before the last, in the, what's the last break, but before the movie is over, he says, and look, we have a lovely roast beef. Look, and he cuts into it. And he says, isn't that juicy and wonderful? And then he, uh, he leaves because he doesn't have to be there for the rest of the movie, and he leaves. Now, there's one thing that most people don't know in television, but anybody I tell this story to knows that who is in television knows this is fact, that most crews, your stagehands, your gaffers, your stage directors, you know, your, whatever, uh, will eat anything, right. okay? <laughs> and they see this thing rotating on a rotisserie for two hours, and when it's over with, they grab the thing and they eat it like crazy. Something they forgot, however, was that the two weeks before this guy had gone out and bought the meat for future shows and put it in a refrigerator on the set which after the show was over, they would unplug and put oh. in the prop room. Oh. And what he was oh. cooking was this rancid, you couldn't tell on television, right, in black and white. It wasn't turning green. And he's halfway through the, uh, through the, through the uh, George Washington, uh, through the uh, Lincoln Tunnel. And in those days, you could do a U-turn. He goes, oh, my God, the crew. And he turns around, does a U-turn in the Lincoln Tunnel, goes back to WPIX. He's pulling up, and there's an ambulance. Oh, oh, <laughs> and they're hauling guys into the ambulance who are then looking at him going, you son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah. You know, at the that, police that was, that was one of the stories McCann told me. That and one other quick story. Uh, guy, guy, they have a, you know, they have an announce booth, and there's an announcer waiting to announce, right? Yeah. And they also had another show going on where they were recording this kid show, and the kid, uh, the show, kid show had a beehive and a um, German shepherd. And the German shepherd knocks over the beehive, and all the beats head for the first place so that they can go and get out of the studio, and that's into a vent which winds up 
in the announce booth. <laughs> and the announcer's doing the station break and the fucking bees attack. So those were the stories I like to hear from Chuck. He was eating biscuits and honey in there too, right? Yeah. <laughs> At the police department, cops like donuts. Yeah. And, and oh, really? citizens, citizens would come by with cakes and donuts and things like that, and they would leave them for the cops in the in the lineup room. No cop would ever eat any of those things because you know that somebody could have uh, put rat poison in it or mm -hmm. uh, X lax or or something. Yeah, uh, and you know if you eat, so nobody would touch those things. And you know there you got all these cops that would eat eat a donut off the ground, but they, yeah. uh, they would eat those. But there's no punchline to this story. No, that's not, it. Not was, like I was telling. Anyway, these were a couple of stories that Chuck McCann told me. And Chuck was, I was good friends with Chuck for quite a while. Uh, he used to have his own screening room at his home. He was one of these guys, He, when the days when you weren't supposed to have these movies, we were watching a 35-millimeter print of Ben-Hur in his little theater that he had. He even had a popcorn machine. Uh, but he was, uh, he was a nice guy, really nice guy. And uh, he was a good friend for quite a while. And then you lose, you know, I went out to California, you lose track of people. And then I got caught up with him on uh, Facebook a couple of years ago. And we said hi, and gee, you know, sometimes you got to come on the show, and it never happened. And now he's dead, and it's never going to happen. So, yeah. How, how did you meet Chuck? Through Earl Dowd. I got to be friends with Earl Dowd, okay. uh, who did the first family. And he mm -hmm. was good friends with Chuck. And, you know, and that's how I met Gene Shepard. You know, Gene Shepard would come over to Earl's house for dinner, and I'd be at the dinner, and there was Gene Shepard telling one of his stories. And then I'd get bored, and I'd go into the living room, turn on the TV set, and Joe Franklin was on, and there was Gene Shepard telling him the same story. You know, it was... Gene Shepard used to put us to sleep as kids. You know, mm -hmm. you have <laughs> Under the cover. Yeah, I know. Gene Shepard. I know. You know what's funny about it all? Uh, I'm friends with Chuck McCann. I'm friends with Gene Shepard, right? These are people who are all legendary yes. to people in New York. And because yeah. I wasn't raised in New York, I didn't care. I just knew these guys as guys and liked them, you know? I mean, why is this guy telling stories at dinner? Oh, well, it's Gene Shepard, you know, and he's telling all these stories. And then you'd go up the road, and you didn't know whether to go left or whether to go right, so you made it, yeah, and whatever. Uh, these are guys who were legends, and I didn't yeah. realize the legendary nature of them because I didn't grow up with it. If I had, I would have been sitting there gobsmacked just being in the presence mm -hmm. of these guys, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Jeff? Yes. Jeff McCann is like my childhood. Him, Joe Bolton, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Jack McC uh, McCarthy. Uh, Fox. Yeah, right. Anyway, uh, Jeff had his hand up. His yeah, hand. Gene Shepard, you know, I mean, he was on, he was on uh, radio all the time. Yeah. But also. But for people who don't know who I'm talking about, he's the voice in A Christmas Story, and he's the guy who wrote A Christmas Story. Yeah. Yeah. So he also had uh, a Saturday night show in the village mm -hmm. and and he would perform and he would tell you one of his stories or three of them or whatever and he, he was a great uh it was a great story it was a great yeah. storyteller and and proof yeah. of that is the narration in a christmas story which is gene shepherd right what yeah, is like really right zachary wrote some uh, uh yeah my work with zach zach was yeah. i was close with zach what was too. It he wrote it was a <clears throat> halloween thing or uh he wrote something that was. Uh, I don't know. He, I just, he was just fun. <laughs> he was fun. Hey, anyway, Alex. Yeah, right. we're running out of time. What, Tim? Well, I just want to say they needed friends like you. That was good. They needed friends like me. Yeah, that one gobsmack. I think that was good for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, hey, listen, uh, that's it for tonight. Wow. Great show, Alex. Great show. Great. Yeah, it was. Uh, and, and we'll have part two next week of uh, my interview with Jack Garfine. And then the following week after that, you can't miss that one, folks. And then we'll put the whole thing up as an hour and 50-minute interview uh, on uh, face on uh, YouTube when we're through with it. Anyway, hey, listen. Thanks to Jack Garfine for being here tonight. Let's thank uh, uh, Phil for sending me a, com a computer. 
Thanks to Jeff Stein. Uh, always love having you here. Rob, glad we got you out of bed tonight, my friend. Um, John Perulis, uh, thank you, as well as Kevin and, of course, Tim. You know what the rest of you can do, guys? You can give everybody a big wave goodbye, okay? Yeah, isn't that nice? Okay. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. I'm Alex Bennett. That's it for tonight. We'll be here again tomorrow night. Yeah, I got to do it again tomorrow night. It's still long. Same time. Uh, but uh, uh, next is the uh, uh, intersection with Jack and Amy. That's followed by a wonderful show called Connections at 1 o'clock in the morning uh, Eastern Time. And tomorrow night, Damien will be here at 930 with uh, the exchange. And then at 10 o'clock, I'll be here again. Same time, same station in life. And in the meantime, as always... If you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye.